Two significant meetings uh, took place in our last uh, lesson that we had. First was the meeting between Joseph and Jacob, which completed the reunification of this family, and it also guaranteed the continuation of the promise made to Abraham and Isaac by God in the past, because the danger of this family being broken up is that the promise would be lost. And so by reuniting the family in one place, the promise was going to continue. And then the second meeting was between Jacob and Pharaoh. The greatest living servant of God meets the greatest living king, earthly king of that period. So we also witnessed the blessing of Joseph's sons, which was to be significant later on because each of his son, Manasseh and Ephraim, were to have an equal standing with Joseph's brothers. So the portion that Joseph got was a double portion given to both of his sons and they were to get equal portions with his brother and that was a demonstration that he received that double portion of the firstborn. We talked about that last time. So the final scene we will see, uh, we'll now see Jacob going on to bless and prophesy concerning each one of his sons. So let's go to chapter 49, start reading verse one. It says, then Jacob summoned his sons and said, assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. So at this point Jacob is near death and he calls his other sons and will prophesy concerning their future. Now as a father, he's got, a, he's got insight into their character and their patterns of behavior as fathers do, right? We know our children, don't we? Isn't it amazing? We, we, we see our children grow up and we say, oh boy, you know, we warn them, we say, you, know, you better get a hold of that or you better control this or that, because you, know, you kind of see them heading for trouble sometimes. Well, no different, Jacob sees that in his sons as well. And um, he uh, is also uh, not just the, a father, but he's a prophet. And so God gives him special insight as a prophet as to what will happen to his sons and their tribes in the future. So he gives each one of the sons information about their future generations as a way of encouraging them or warning them for correction or for change. So he starts with the eldest son, and that would be Reuben, and he says in verse three and four, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Uncontrolled as water, you shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. So here, uh, Jacob confirms what is true about firstborns in general, that they are a joy and a testimony to a man's youth and strength. Firstborn son, something very special about that. However, Reuben, because of his sin with Bila, which was his father's uh, uh, wife, uh, if you wish, is told that uh, he will not amount to much. Uh, she was the servant, rather, she was the servant. But still, she was his. She was not Reuben's servant. Um, uh, so because of his sin with Bila, he's told that he's not going to amount to much. So the prophecy is fulfilled in the future. The tribe of Reuben never produced a great leader. The Reubenites were first to settle. Remember them? They didn't want to cross the Jordan to go with the others. They wanted to say this side of the Jordan and settle right away. They uh, erected a false place of worship. We read about that in Joshua 22. And in the days of Deborah, they failed to answer the call to take arms and defend the nation. We read about that in the Judges chapter five, verse 15. So uh, by, of course, it's easier for us. We, you know, we've got hindsight. We can read about what took place with all of these tribes. Uh, Jacob's prophecy about Reuben not accounting to much is, uh, is amply fulfilled in the future. Next, he talks to Simeon and to Levi. And he says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let not my glory be unified with their assembly, because in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. 
I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So these two are mentioned together because they were close and they always, they kind of operated together. And Jacob you know, disassociates himself from their violent acts and their violent motives. Remember them? They're the ones that killed the Shechemites and destroyed their property and wanton cruelty and violence. Remember they, the, the young man who uh, raped their sister, they went in, not only took revenge on that person, but I mean wiped out the town, killed everybody. He then says that, or Jacob then says, he's going to split them up. Isn't that what we do sometimes? If you've ever been a school teacher, you know, two kids sitting in the, near each other, okay, you, you sit over there, you, you know. Or even brothers and sisters or people in the same family, when two certain sibling, siblings get together, there's trouble. You know? So Jacob knows that. And, and so he separates them. Now later on, we learn that they were divided and did not form a union between their two tribes. Simeon eventually was absorbed by Judah and eventually scattered outside of Israel. Uh, and very little is heard of them after Solomon's reign. Levi, of course, was the tribe that Moses and Aaron came from and the priests and temple servants were assigned from this tribe. They were not given land, but they dwelt in cities given to them. So it seems that the tribe of Levi put their natural zeal uh, uh, to better use, if you wish, because they became very enthusiastic defenders of the law and they were honored by serving as priests. So you know what, 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 what Jacob is saying here, he's warning, he warned both Simeon and Levi the danger that they could get into by being together and uh, 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 Simeon, nothing happened to him. In other words, what, what uh, Jacob said eventually happened to them. Uh, but Levi, Levi changed. Levi you know, took that warning seriously and ultimately became a, a great servant of the Lord. He goes on to talk about Judah. So you see the, the course of this lesson here. We're just going to go through these sons here. Talks about Judah, verse eight. He says, Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey colt to the choice vine, he washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull from wine, his teeth are white from milk. So by the time Jacob gets to Judah, he's finally got some kind of good things to say about one of his sons. Um, the name Judah means praise. And in the future, his brothers would praise him for several reasons. First of all, he would subdue his enemies. Secondly, he would assume the mantle of leadership normally held by the firstborn. Remember, Joseph received the double portion that usually went to the firstborn. Joseph was not the firstborn. Judah then, he received the leadership. Okay? Now he would be as secure as a mature lion in his den. That's what Jacob is saying, this is how secure you will be, just like a lion is secure in his habitat, if you wish. And then when he talks about the scepter shall not uh, depart from Judah, he did receive the scepter, right, of leadership, but not until David, who was from the tribe of Judah, uh, 640 years later. So it took 640 years for this prophecy to be completed, okay? Because David eventually became king, and David came from the tribe of Judah, but that would only happen, as I said, 640 years later, the scepter, the, the, rule, the rulership would eventually come to someone from Judah's lineage. Um, uh, all previous leaders were from other tribes, okay? But once David became king, Judah was the dominant tribe from then on. Now he says that the scepter or the rule or the role of dominance and leadership would not pass from Judah until Shiloh came. That is an interesting term. Historically, this was proven to be true. 
Although Israel was attacked and deported throughout the years, Judah remained the dominant tribe, always. It was Judah and Benjamin that came back from captivity, and by the time of Jesus, the Israelite nation became synonymous with the tribe of Judah because all the other tribes had been assimilated or been destroyed. The other 10 tribes were gone. They had been deported from, northern, you know, from the northern kingdom. Those were gone. All, everyone was gone. Every, the only tribe left was Judah and, and, and Benjamin. The term Jew, you ever wonder where does the term Jew comes from? Well, the term Jew comes from the root word for Judah, the tribe of Judah. Uh, Shiloh is a Hebraic word that can be translated several ways. It can mean unto him all people shall gather. Or it can mean the one who brings peace. Or, <laughs> if that's not enough, one word, imagine. Uh, it can mean, until he comes whose right it is. Until he come whose right it is. But in either translation, the meaning comes out. Jacob said that the tribe of Judah would ascend to rulership and, then, and that they would remain there until a certain one came. Which one? Shiloh, which one was that? Well, the one who will bring peace the one who will gather the people, the one who has the right. Until that one arrives, Judah will be the dominant, uh, the dominant uh, tribe. So the prophecy was fulfilled, of course, in Jesus Christ, because Judah did remain the dominant tribe until Jesus. And Jesus has other right, titles, Prince of Peace. Right? He's the one that gathered the church. He's the one sent by God and therefore had the right to do what he did. So Judah lasted in dominance until Jesus came, Shiloh. Jesus is Shiloh, okay? And we know this historically because, remember, Judah was the dominant tribe when, Je when Jesus came, but only a few years after Jesus ascended to heaven, in 70 AD, after Jesus departed, the Romans completely destroyed Jerusalem and took captive her people. More importantly, there was never again a Jewish king from the tribe of Judah or any tribe for that matter uh, to this day. So the scepter did stay with Judah until Jesus came and then was removed and given to whom? Well, given to the church. The church has the scepter now with Christ as its head. And Jesus was from this tribe, right? He was also from the tribe of Judah. So Jacob predicted this uh, roughly 2,000 years before it came to pass. Well, we go on talking about the brothers, or Jacob does. He says in verse uh, 13, uh, he says, Zebulun will uh, dwell at the seashore, and he shall be a haven for ships, and his flank shall be toward Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between the sheepfolds. When he saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, he bowed his shoulder to bear burdens, or rather he bowed his shoulder to uh, bear burdens and became a slave at forced, uh, at forced labor. So there are two other sons, uh, these two other sons of Leah and Jacob, and he touches on each of these very briefly. Zebulun would live and thrive towards the sea, and his later territory would extend between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean. Jesus' later ministry right, was conducted in this area, in the northern part of the country, between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. He says that even though Issachar was wealthy in land, but lazy by character, and eventually this laziness uh, would cost him. And eventually this led him to being overrun and enslaved. So in the end, Issachar was uh, in servitude to the others, just as Jacob had uh, prophesied. He moves on to talk about Dan. He says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path, that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. For your salvation I wait, O Lord. So Dan was a son of a handmaid, 
but he, assured, he was assured by Jacob that he would have land and he would have a place of leadership. Now Jacob also reveals some of the events in Dan's future. First of all, the reference to the adder uh, uh, and serpent may refer to the fact that Dan was one of the smallest tribes, but quite fierce in defending its territory. Also the idea of the serpent suggests evil, and we know that it was Dan that introduced idolatry on an official basis in the land, Judges 18 uh, verse 30. And also Dan was the place where Jeroboam, who led a revolt against Solomon, set up idolatrous calves for worship. So uh, interesting, however, is the fact that this is the first, where you see, for your salvation I wait, O Lord. This is the first time that the word salvation is used in the Bible. Interesting that it's introduced right here. Uh, he goes on uh, to say in verse uh, 19 to 21, as for Gad, raiders shall raid him, but he will raid at their heels. As for Asher, his food shall be rich, and he will yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a doe at let loose, he gives beautiful words. So you have Gad and Asher, Naphtali. You know, Gad is assured that although he was geographically vulnerable from attack, he would be able to repel his attackers. Asher would receive a choice and rich piece of land, but history showed that because of this ease and luxury, the tribe eventually uh, failed to conquer all of its rightful land and eventually became insignificant. And then Naphtali would be known for swiftness as well as the literate minds and uh, production. And uh, we know Deborah's victory, for example, her victory song fulfills partially this ability with uh, words. She was from that particular tribe, so Judges 5. Uh, we read about that in Judges chapter 5, verse 1 to 31. And then he talks about Joseph um, from verse 22 to 26. He says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. Its branches run over a wall. The archers bitterly attacked him and shot at him and harassed him. But his bow remained firm and his arms were agile from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. For there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel from the God of your Father who helps you, and by the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your Father have surpassed the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of the one distinguished among his brothers. So quite a long passage here talking about Joseph. Jacob's best words are reserved for Judah and for Joseph. To one, the promise of spiritual blessings, right? And then, uh, and leadership and strength, that's Judah. That promise goes to Judah. And then to the other, the blessings of physical prosperity in family and abundance and strength. That promise goes to Joseph. Both of these men were faithful. One of them was faithful from a young age, Joseph, and the other grew faithful with time, Judah. But both became so through adversity. God is referred to here as the shepherd, again, for the first time. He's referred to as a rock or a stone. All figures repeated by Christ in the New Testament. Jacob also acknowledges that he had greater blessing than his father or grandfather and that he would shower greater blessings on Joseph and his grandchildren. Uh, a little bit like the, the grandparent who's spoiling his grandkids. You know, he's saying, you know, when I was young, you know, my father didn't have a whole lot and I just had a little bit more than my dad, but my kids, my grandchildren, they're going to have even a lot more than I do, basically is what he's promising here uh, to his son Joseph and their sons uh, and his other sons. And then finally we have uh, Benjamin, right? Let's not forget Benjamin, verse 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey and in the evening he divides the spoil. So of the final and the youngest uh, son, Jacob predicts that he will be strong and aggressive but become cruel and voracious. Um, of course, uh, uh, Benjamin, uh, his tribe were almost destroyed because of a battle waged against them for having attacked and raped a woman. And then later on Saul 
comes from this tribe, doesn't he? He comes from the tribe of Benjamin. He becomes the first king of Israel. So with this, all of the sons have been blessed or warned, and Jacob utters his last words. So now we go to uh, verse 28. We read about the last things that Jacob uh, is going to say. So we read and we pick it up in verse 28. It says, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said to them when he blessed them. He blessed them, every one with the blessing appropriate to him. Then he charged them and he said to them, I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field from Ephron the Hittite for a burial site. There they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife Rebekah. And there I buried uh, Leah, the field and the cave that is in it, purchased from the sons of Heth. When Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. So now Jacob gives the final instructions to all of them, and that is to bury him with his father and grandfather and their wives. And of course, the reason for this is he will give a testimony of, of their combined faith that they believed God even though they did not receive the promise. Remember, he's in another land. God has promised that he would give him the land of Canaan, that would be his land, and at the moment he's living in Egypt. So for sure that promise has not been fulfilled. The only thing they own is a burial plot. The only thing that they own is a burial plot. And he's saying as a way of faith, as a way of making a testimony you know, to, to his sons, he's saying, when I die, you'll take me back and bury me in the land of, of Canaan. One more way that I can witness that I believe the Lord and I believe the promise that he's, that he's made. Uh, the term gathered to his people is not just buried, but gone to join the others like him who believe and await the coming of the Lord. So we pick up chapter 50, that's the end. We pick up chapter 50 and we see Jacob's burial. So interesting because this is historical here. We, we wouldn't really need this information. You know, he, he died, he's buried with, his, with Abraham and Isaac. You know, it could end there. But, but we get more, more information about that time. So it says, then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Now 40 days were required for it, for such is the period required for embalming, and the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. So Jacob's death is mourned not only by his sons, but also by the nation. The embalming process took 40 days. The national mourning period was 70 days. So it seems that Jacob had become recognized as a great man even among the pagans where he lived for several years before his death. We pick it up in verse four. It says, when the days of mourning for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh saying, if now I have found favor in your sight, please speak to Pharaoh saying, my father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am about to die. In my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please, let me go up and bury my father, then um, I will return. Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt and all the household of Joseph and his brothers and his father's household. They left only their little ones and their flocks and their herds in the land of Goshen. There also went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. So we need to remember Joseph is in subjection to the Pharaoh here and needed permission to go, which he readily received. The group then went with him, shows that uh, the nation accorded this particular burial the same importance as a state funeral. So this was like a state funeral. The families, had, however, had every intention of returning. It doesn't say it here, but you read between the lines, Egypt is home. <laughs> Egypt is now home. 
They're not going home now. They're, they're just going to go bury them in the old country. You know, I, had, I have Italian relatives you know, who had left Italy and, you know, and they lived in Canada and so on and so forth. But when they were buried and when they, when they died, they wanted, to be, they wanted to go back to Italy and be buried back in Italy, back in the old country. You know? So it's kind of this feeling to go back. Of course, more important here for Jacob, but we, you know, we, we understand that, that feeling, don't we? Even today. Um, in verse 10 to 14, not going to read that, but it just says uh, the, the next passage, it describes the funeral itself and the elaborate ceremonies that both Joseph's family and the Egyptians went through when they arrived at the burial cave. We'll pick up our reading at verse 15 here to move it along. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, uh, behold, we are your, uh, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for, I, uh, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Imagine these are the guys that put him in the well. The, you know, they left him to die. They sold him into slavery, spent years and years in prison because of these guys. And now look, look, he's, it says, so he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. What a, what a change of heart for, for everyone. Uh, the interesting sidelight is that the brothers become afraid that with jo uh, Jacob's death, Joseph, you know, nothing holding them back now. Now he could take his revenge. They even tried to make restitution by offering themselves as slaves like they, like they made out of him. And of course he's touched deeply and finally he's convinced of their sincerity and their repentance. He really believes that these guys really, really have changed. He, refers, he refuses their offer and he reassures them in two ways. One, he promises to continue supporting them and their children. And two, he acknowledges that even though it was evil what they did, God used that evil for good and so even he had to defer to God's will not to punish. And then the, uh, the uh, final passage here talks about Joseph's death in verses 22 to 26. It says, now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons. Also the sons of Machir, the sons of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. Um, Jacob died when Joseph was 56 years old. So notice here, just a little thing, a little side note, man's longevity is starting to decline after the, uh, after the flood, right? Abraham lived 175, Isaac 180, whoops, Joseph 147, now uh, Jacob 147, now Joseph 110 years. Now Joseph was blessed in that he lived to see and bury his father and even enjoy his own great, great grandchildren. A wonderful blessing indeed. There's a passage that says that God gives us back the wasted years. He gives us back the wasted years. For, for many of us who were converted as adults, you know, we, we didn't know the Lord, we came to know the Lord as, as full adults. You think back of all the wasted time that you had, all the time you wasted in the world, you know, not knowing the Lord and acting and sinfully and so on and so forth. You know, it's, at the beginning, when you first become a Christian, there's a lot of regret, you know, that look at all the time I wasted. And all, well, I wish I would have known this long ago. You know. Who knows, maybe uh, you've destroyed a marriage. Maybe you, you did things that you just can't take back or fix. You know. But the Lord gives back the wasted years. It's as if those things never happen. When you're forgiven, when you begin your new life, you know, the new life is so full, is so rich, that, that the wasted years seem like nothing. You know compared to what God has, uh, has given you. So let's keep reading verse 24. It says, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which He promised on oath to Abraham, 
to Isaac and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. So it's interesting that Joseph, who was to, uh, the second youngest, dies before his brothers. Who knows, maybe all that time in prison you know, didn't, do him, didn't do him a whole lot of good. You know, who knows? Um, he uses the occasion to remind his brothers that God's original promise was to give them the land of Canaan, and even though they're in Egypt and they're comfortable in Egypt, God will eventually take them out, and His prophecy will be fulfilled about 400 years later with Moses. As a testimony to his faith, he makes them promise, the same promise that Jacob made, make sure you bury me in the promised land. And this also was fulfilled in Exodus 13, 19. The children of Israel took his bones with them when they left Egypt under Moses. The brothers didn't go and bury him right away. His bones stayed in, Israel for four, in Egypt for four centuries. It's when the people of Israel were released you know, in the Exodus, when they were finally released from e Egyptian bondage, that's when they took Joseph's bones and brought them uh, with them. Um, uh, he was embalmed, like all great leaders of Egypt, and his crypt was known publicly at the time. So this is the end of Genesis and the story of creation of the world, the selection of God's people. They're settling in Egypt. You know, we come to the written end of the passages that we've been following in Genesis. Next, in our next and final lesson, I'm going to try to draw some general lessons from the entire thing, you know, kind of package it all together. But for tonight, I want to just draw some lessons from what we have read, the passages that we've read, and mainly prophecies, right? About, we've just read what Jacob said, what his sons would do and what would happen to them and how these things were fulfilled. Then we read about the death of Jacob, we read about the death of Joseph, but there are even lessons here. And the first one, very obvious, nothing can stop God's promises, nothing. I mean, Joseph was sold, there was the famine. There may have, this may have been the work of Satan to try to destroy the family. Uh, uh, they had hardship, there was separation, and yet none of these things could stop the promise of God to this family from being fulfilled, nothing. You know, Satan may work against you, and he will, he will, absolutely, but never doubt that God will fulfill his promises to you personally. If he said he's going to save you, he will. If he said he's going to resurrect you, he will. If he says that he has forgiven you, he has, and he will continue to do so. If he says he'll be with you, he will be with you. No matter what happens, he will be with you, always. Nothing can stop God's promises. Lesson number two, looks can be deceiving. It didn't look, you know, it didn't look like it, but Jacob was the greater man when compared to the Pharaoh. Jacob was the great man, not the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh had all the pomp and circumstance, he had the army and the wealth and you know, the image. You know? Jacob was a, what, a shepherd. <laughs> a shepherd looking for food because he was starving to death with his family. A raggedy bunch, right? And yet Jacob was the great man. And you're saying, well, so where's the parallel? Well, the parallel is here. The church today looks kind of puny and helpless at times and you see the power of governments, or you see the power of the media, or rich people, you know? uh, how quickly a lie or something so crazy you know, about how, what life is about and so on and so forth, you know, it makes the front page and it's, people write books about it, you know? goes around the world 10 times before we can even you know, get out the, the door. You know? the, the world looks so much more powerful than the church. And yet God has said that the church is invincible. Governments come and go, powers come and go, nations come and go, ideas come and go, great men and women come and go. The church remains. Why? Because Jesus, the Son of God, said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Nothing will destroy it. Nothing will outlast it. So let's never be discouraged 
about you know, the, let's never be discouraged, not about the church, but let's never be, allow ourselves to be discouraged when we compare what the church looks like and how big it is compared to something in the world, some institution or you know, army or government. You think, wow, how can we ever survive? And yet we have. You know, we're the living proof of it. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about Jesus. We're still teaching about Genesis. 2,000 years later, I'm going to ask you something. What government, what power remains from 2,000 years ago? Anything? Roman government? The empire of the Romans? Any great leader? Any, any wealthy person? Any family? Is there anything that, that is left from 2,000 years ago? Not much. The only thing that's still vibrant and growing 2,000 years later from that period is the church. And the further we get away from that period of time, the stronger the uh, testimony of the church becomes. So remember, looks can be deceiving. Don't, don't be discouraged. And then maybe one other one. God forgives and forgets even when we can't. You know, the brothers had been forgiven, but they couldn't forgive themselves. That's the problem. They had trouble forgiving themselves. And they kept trying to do something to make restitution. You know, they said, well, we'll be your slaves. Or, well, you know, I'll give my children over to be your, you know. They kept trying to make up for what they did. But nothing they could give could pay Joseph back the 13 years and the anguish that he suffered in prison and the slavery that he had undergone. What could they give him to give him back all those years? You know, like the, the best part of his life. But his offer of forgiveness is like God's offer. It was based on grace. We need to remember that the essence of the gospel is that Jesus makes restitution for all of the evil that we have done. And when we accept Him in repentance and baptism, God forgives and forgets all of our sins in the sense that He covers them over. That's something even we cannot do. We can forgive people for things they may have done against us, but we never actually forget it, right? It's always in our memory, and that's okay, it's human. But God actually, He says, I will see them no more when He talks about our sins. He forgives us and He doesn't deal with us based on our sinfulness anymore. He deals with us based on grace and love. I tell people who have guilty consciences, well, if you're not a Christian, I know how to solve your guilty conscience problem. You know, confess Christ and be baptized. You know, that's, how the, that's what you do. You know what I'm saying? But what really touches me as a minister, what really kind of, oh, you know, I, I, I feel for people, is people who are Christians who have followed the Lord for years faithfully and yet still feel guilty about things that they may have said or done in the past. You know, terrible things at times. You know, and, they, and they just can't, they can't kind of wire themselves to forgive themselves. And I tell them, look, if God forgives you, then you have the right to forgive yourself. If God has not forgiven you, it don't matter what you do. You can have counseling and you can you know, go see a shrink and try to you know, blot out the past and have a frontal lobotomy or whatever, you know what I'm saying? If God, haven't, if God hasn't forgiven you, you'll never be forgiven. But if God has forgiven you, you have the right, you have the duty to forgive yourself so that you can live a new and renewed life. That's the marvelous, you know, the marvelous message of the gospel. That's the good news in the gospel, right? I've said that I don't know how many times. The good news is God is forgiving you, so you can forgive yourself and just move on. And people say, well, I, I, can't, I can't forget the things in the past. And I tell them, instead of thinking about the things in the past, think about the things in the future. Like Paul says, right? Paul the Apostle, guilty of killing and, and injuring Christians and hating Christ. What did he say? Forgetting what lies behind. I forget that. I do what? I look ahead. I press on. You know, 
So I tell people, keep your eyes focused on heaven. That's where we're going, that's the promise. Keep your eyes focused on the cross of Christ. You know, when you're tempted to think about the bad old days or what you did and so on and so forth, erase that, forget that. Just, you know, my method was to go immediately into prayer and say, Lord, this thing is bothering me and I, I know you've forgiven me, so please help me stay focused on you. Let me focus on heaven and the good things to come. And eventually, you know, if you're thinking right, you start to act right, you start to feel right. All right, that's lesson 49. So one more, if God is willing, we'll be together next week again and we'll cap it all off with chapter number 50. Thank you very much.